Welcome to episode 70 of Sport SA Daily Diary. Today we chat to the South African woman who smashed the Comrades Marathon record, our very own Gerda Stein. Gerda, how are you doing today? Hey, um, thank you. I'm very well. Thank you very much. And how are you? <laughs> oh, thank you. Lovely to chat to you uh, all the way in the UAE of all places. Yes, that is correct. I've been spending the entire lockdown here in the UAE. Um, we've had similar rules to South Africa. We had very strict lockdown. Um, but now as time goes on, we are easing off and we are also now allowed to exercise outdoors. So I'm not complaining at all. Well, that must be a amazing training for you, training in the, in the heat of the UAE. You come back to South Africa and it's like it's run, running in the middle of winter. Uh, yes, it is definitely a contrast to um, what we're experiencing in South Africa to here. Um, but um, this is very flat, yes, it's at sea level as well. So um, what, I, what I lose in South Africa, I gain in the UAE because here yeah, it's very hot. So I'm now um, just looking at it as a, a good block of heat training. <laughs> oh, sure. And Gerry, uh, um, you only started running at the age of 24 in the UAE or in Dubai, funnily enough. Why were you not running before that? Yes, uh, that's correct. And it's a very good question. Um, so before 2014, um, I did do a bit of running. Uh, I ran socially a little bit. Um, during the years I studied at Kofsis in Bloemfontein. And even there, I did do a little bit of running, but um, nowhere near competitive. Or it, I really didn't show any sign of talent or anything. Um, it was really just for my own pleasure every other day in the week. Um, but in 2014, I um, got a job opportunity to come and work in Dubai and um, I decided to take it on. I was a quantity surveyor at the time and um, it was just a nice adventure for me at that time in my life. Um, but when I arrived here in the UAE, uh, I met a group of runners and they were very avid comrades runners. So they were expats um, living in Dubai um, and they were from across the world and they just, they all had this big passion for the comrades marathon. And um, I really got sucked into the community. Um, they, the first thing when they met me, they asked why am I not running the comrades marathon because I'm a South African. Exactly. So, um, Yes, I then started training with them, um, but it, as well, in the beginning, it was just social running, but um, my running improved very rapidly um, the minute I started training properly and following structured programs. So it happened all very quickly um, until I came to a point where um, I was able to make this my career. So that's sort of the background in a nutshell, um, but yes, uh, it feels like it all happened very, very quickly, but there, a lot has happened in the meantime as well. And Gerda, tell us, is there any um, running um, genes from, from your parents or grandparents or anywhere in the family? Because, I mean, you're, from your career, you are a phenomenal athlete, and we'll get to your comrades a bit later, but I mean, you really are an incredibly strong female athlete. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, actually, no, I don't have a history or a family of athletes, really. Um, but I do have to say that we all enjoy sports. Um, my siblings, both my brother and my sister, loves running. Um, and we've always had an active lifestyle. But um, I don't have a family of athletes. Um, and when the, the, the day when I um, told my family that I'm giving up my office job now to become an athlete, I think it came to a bit of a shock to everyone um, because it's just something new and something that um, we're not used to. But, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I, I am quite happy that it only came later in my life. Um, I feel now I'm fresh. I've not had all my childhood years spent on an athletics track. Um, I learned other skills, um, not being focused so much on running from a young age. And now I'm in a, in a space in my life where I can focus on only running and, and be serious about it and just do it, to, you know, to my own, you know, not having any other history to, to hold me back or looking at old times that was maybe faster than what I'm running at the moment. So yeah. it is, it's refreshing and, and I love that it only came later in my life. I, I don't take it for granted. And do you think the fact that it has come later in your life and the fact that it is fresh 
that you seem to have a lot more passion um, for it and a lot more love for the sport. Do you think that's a reason why it's still it's because it's still very new to you? I think definitely the fact that it's new to me helps in, in, in keeping me motivated and keeping me really excited about the sport. Um, I don't want to compare myself to anyone else because everyone else has got a different story. Um, some, some other athletes who's maybe been doing it their entire lives would say that that has helped them. They've learned how to have discipline from a young age. So I'm just using what, what, I'm, what I know about running and, and learning from what I can see, what other people have done in the past and the, the mistakes they've made. Um, so I, I'm just enjoying my own story. I'm writing my own story which is very, it's unique compared to many other runners' um, backgrounds. But I, I like it and I'm, I'm fortunate that how it played out. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, Heather, you grew up in Puerteville in the Free State. Um, I must say, before I um, did a little bit of research on you, I hadn't heard of Puerteville. Um, uh. <laughs> small town girl, um, are your parents still there? Uh, tell us a bit about your, your, your younger years. Did you play any other sports at school or...? Tell us a bit about the, the young uh, Gerda. Yes, I grew up in this small town, actually outside um, the small town of Witherville on a farm. And my parents are farmers and they are still farmers today. Um, so it was me and my two siblings who grew up on the farm with my parents. And um, my school years, um, primary school as well as high school, I spent in Witherville. Um, during school years, I did, like I said before as well, I practiced sport, I enjoyed the outdoors and doing it socially, but no, I never really stood out in anything specifically, um, especially not in running. Um, even in my small school um, that I was in, I was never a star athlete <laughs> in any distance. Um, however, I never, I never took on cross country, um, and I'm sure even today, I'm sure that if that if I decided to do cross country somewhere in my life, I might have discovered that I had a talent earlier on in my life, but it just never appealed to me at the time. So um, when I went to university after high school, I studied at Bloemfontein in Kofsies, and there I started running a little bit with a friend of mine. Um, we were doing it just for a bit of fun and just to stay, uh, you know, a little bit fit. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it, it, it is funny for me as well. It's, it's so strange, but uh, here I am, and that's just how it worked out. But, yes, my entire upbringing I spent in Wetherville. It's a very small community. Like you say, you had to look it up before you knew. Um, so it's in the free state, and it's a very small, tight community. Um, and I think now even um, everyone there, when I go back to Wetherville or the community, it's, it's, so, it's such a positive you know, vibe that I feel when I get there. They never expected this from me. Um, my old teachers, old classmates, uh, they would not have thought in their wildest dreams that I would be the one who would become an athlete. Um, so I think it's just a real positive thing for the whole community there. And I'm just grateful for where, where I grew up. And I, I'm sure that growing up on a farm is where I learned to enjoy the outdoors and and that's just a part of who I am. So I mean, they must be incredibly proud of you. I think if there was a, a keys to Puerteville, they would certainly give it to you without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, um, Heather, in studying, uh, you studied to become a quantity surveyor. Interesting career choice. Yes, that is correct. So um, during the last two years of um, my school years, I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to become. Um, but um, uh, I've got a brother who's three years older than me, and he studied to be a quantity surveyor. And mm -hmm. I found it quite interesting how he explained it. Uh, I saw what he was doing, and I got to learn more about the profession and the construction world. So I decided to study, follow his footsteps and also study quantity surveying. And it was a great experience. I mean, I often wonder nowadays whether it was worth for me going to university and, you know, becoming something that I'm not using at the moment. But I think that there's so many other lessons that I learned from that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't regret studying. Um, you learn a lot of social skills. You learn to work in a group. You learn to work, to work you know, focus on yourself and uh, mm -hmm. be responsible for your own work, you know. So there was a lot of lessons that I learned. Um, it, it, it just teaches you life lessons, um, which I don't take for granted. 
So um, it was after I studied in, uh, in Bloemfontein that I started working in Johannesburg. So I started working there for, for a couple of years before I then moved to the UAE where, where my running took off. So let's get on to your running. Um, I think probably the, the listeners really want to hear about your amazing career to date. Um, did running when you first started there in, in Dubai, did it come naturally to you? Because there's a lot of people that, that go out and they jog and they exercise through running, but it doesn't actually come naturally to them. Did it immediately come naturally to you? Did you feel comfortable and, and were you able to just go with the flow? Um, I would say definitely yes. It came very naturally to me. Um, I might not have uh, appreciated it so much at the time because um, I didn't have anything to measure myself against. So uh, I just thought I, I joined a running club that was already fit runners. They were all training for a marathon. They were training for the Comrades Marathon. So I wasn't before I, I joined the running club, but. I joined and it was quite easy for me to improve. Um, it happened very rapidly and I could keep up with them within a couple of weeks of training more, you know, speed, um, focused running, etc. So I would say definitely it came very naturally to me. However, I didn't know at the time that it wasn't usual how it goes for anyone who's just taken on running for the first time in their life. So I started training with them in October 2014. and. I ran my first marathon then in January after being persuaded by them to join them for the Dubai Marathon. And already there, I showed uh, a massive improvement. Um, the guys I was training with at the time were way behind me when we were running the marathon. So it, it was, of course, very naturally to me. And a lot of the um, new friends that I made here told me that I might have a talent and um, this is quite spectacular for them to see but again I just maybe thought that they were being kind to me or I don't know I just I was a little bit naive about it in the beginning so um, it then took a couple more years for me to really realize that I might have a chance at this I might have to you know this uh, make decisions to to allow myself to have more time to focus purely on this because I never know when I will stop improving. I've just been improving now for months on end. So for me, it was almost the sky was the limit. And uh, when you were sort of going through that period of discovering yourself as a runner, um, was there a specific moment that you thought, uh, I, I'm actually bloody good at this and I can make a career? Or was that a gradual sort of um, finding out process that, that you went through? Yes, there were certain moments, not a single moment, I think. Um, there were certain moments during that time where I definitely, um, you know, almost uh, surprised myself as well as the, my friends around me. Um, I then trained um, after my first marathon. I ran the Comrades Marathon a few months later. And even then, um, it was no, no spectacular time, probably if you look at it now. But I finished in 8 hours and 19 minutes, which was... I mean, it, it was good for someone who started running only less than a year ago. So I, then already, I already then started thinking about, you know, maybe I could, I don't know, maybe run in the top 10 of the ladies or something. But it was just this crazy dreams that I had and this, this massive new adventure that was on. But um, in that same year, I then um, made a, a goal for myself to run under three hours for the marathon because... Also, um, I then met Nick Bester from Netbank Running Club, who's now coaching me. And he also said to me that um, I must run under three hours for the marathon. And if I do that, he will take me on and he will coach me. So um, then it was a huge motivation for me um, to get under that three hour mark. And I did it within a couple more months time. So, it, it happened gradually. Um, there was definitely another moment that I can think of now. Um, in 2017, I was quite badly injured. Uh, yes, 2017. Um, I was quite badly injured. Unfortunately, I suffered a stress fracture. And um, I wasn't uh, able to compete in the Two Oceans Marathon that year um, because I was literally on crutches. And then um, after, you know, during the time I was having to spend not on the road running, um, I learned a lot about cross-training and getting fitter 
but without running. So um, then it, when it got really close to the Comrades Marathon, um, I only just got off my crutches, but all of a sudden I felt quite fit when I started running again. And I thought, you know what, what have I got to lose? I could just as well give it a go. And um, I finished in fourth place that year. And that moment I really, really knew that this is not just something normal. They might, I must be able to improve this a lot more because I didn't train. Um, my longest run that year was 40 kilometers. and um, that was two weeks before the Comrades Marathon. So it was just like this, this, uh, this massive, I don't know, it, I couldn't sleep four days on end after that race I'm because sure. I really knew at that moment that something great can come from my career as an athlete. I might not be there in that moment, but I'm um, definitely, there, there's potential. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a fellow Comrades runner myself, I know the amount of training it takes. So for the fact that you got off your crutches and you came forth within a few weeks or whatever, I mean, you are incredibly modest about your achievement. Specifically uh, that one, before we get to the, the really big ones. Yeah, it was an incredible day that, I mean, everybody would always say that the worst position to finish is probably fourth or 11th. But I think I was happier than the winner that year. It was the most incredible day. Even until today, it was fun for the books. I will never forget that day where I was fourth. <laughs> and Gerda, you mentioned that uh, Nick Best is your coach. He's obviously here in South Africa. You're out there in the UAE. How does that work, essentially? Yes, um, that is true. So we just we to each other on a daily basis and see my programs and I follow and report back to him daily and um, so it works really well uh, it, it, we did it in this manner from um, training there I spent most of my comrades and do oceans training normally in South Africa or in Basutu then he would even join me um, on my training camps etc so it, it works really well for us um, as long as we just keep in close contact um, throughout my training is it to keep in contact um, but yes, other than that, um, I spend time abroad, um, either in Dubai or in France, even where I do often do training camps in, in the French. So we're used to the system in this manner. So it's been working really well. Yeah. And I mean, not only do you uh, train out in the French Alps, you also train in Lesotho. And I know this firsthand, not from following you on Instagram, but my father-in-law works in Lesotho and he's driven <laughs> past you a few times and hooted and waved. Um, what's the wow, that's like incredible. there? Is, is it, um, are the people very friendly? Is it safe? Um, do you enjoy being out there in the, in the open air in the mountains? Yes, uh, Lesotho is an incredible place to train. It's very quiet and we stay at Afriski Mountain Resort and it's very, very quiet up there. There's not a lot of movement, which for me is perfect for training. Um, it's at a very high altitude, above 3,000 meters um, above sea level, which is almost extreme altitude. Um, there's very few places that's actually where you can go that high and still run on fairly flat roads. So I really love training there. I think it's perfect um, for me being a road runner as well, um, because there are tarmac roads that's perfectly paved and well looked after. But for trail running, there's of course um, loads of trails around as well. So it's very, it's it's an amazing place to train, and the local people are super friendly. Um, we've never had incidents of um, hearing anything that is unsafe, but. We do stay in groups. Um, I know that there can be wild dogs around, etc. So we always go in, in small groups or try to at least not be um, totally on your own when, you, when I go there. So um, I've got great memories spending it there in Apriski and everyone is always very friendly. Yeah, I'm sure. And then Gerda, 2018 came around uh, and you had your first big win with the two oceans. Uh, a time of three hours, 39 and 32. Tell us a bit about that race. Yes, uh, 2018 was another breakthrough year for me. Um, I, I lined up for the Two Oceans Marathon after having missed out the previous year because of my injury. 
And um, so the previous time I ran the Comrades was two years ago and um, I finished in 14th position but that race was very tough for me I struggled um, I wasn't strong enough yet at the time so um, I, I, I was a little bit nervous going into the 2018 Two Oceans Marathon but um, me and my husband went um, to Cape Town over a long weekend and we trained a little bit on the route just to get accustomed with the heels again and almost just get the, the demons out of my mind from two years ago and it did give me a lot of confidence. I felt really prepared going into the race, but I knew that the race, um, the competition was very strong that year. People were saying it, has been, it was the, the strongest competition in the female race that the race has ever seen. So I was quite nervous, but still confident. And I knew that my training went well. It's, it has been then more than a year where my training was really just going very, very well. Um, so um, that race it was really a breakthrough um, when I got into um, finally at the top of Constantia Neck, which is obviously the runners don't know the second of the two big hills. Um, I was I only just then um, took the lead, and um, I just knew that this would have probably be the toughest seven kilometers of my life. But um, I'll have to just fast bait and then get get to the finish line as fast as I can. So um, winning the race um, in 2018 was just incredible. And um, I'm really like that race. The one thing that I took from that race was just starting to believe in myself and starting to believe that I can be a champion. Um, it often you often see in athletics that a lot of people train hard. Everybody can train for a marathon or for an ultra marathon, but it's not everybody who can get to the race in the right shape and still also on race day fight to get the first spot. And it, it made me believe in myself. Um, so yes, it, it was a great experience that year. And once again, one day that I will not forget ever. <laughs> and then that same year, Conrad, you came second. You mentioned earlier that fourth place must be, and 11th must be one of the difficult. I would imagine that second must be one of the, the more difficult ones to swallow because you're just so close. Yes, that's very true. It's so close, but so far. So um, after then coming off a great two oceans in 2018, um, I think it was my first big win. I don't know. I really tried to stay focused and stay, stay within, you know, focusing on the next task ahead, which was the Comrades Marathon. And I did. I definitely did. I was even in the situ at the training camp. But I think looking back, it must must have just been maybe a little bit too much for me. Um, all the new pressure of the press on me and I had to do articles and I had no idea what I was going on. So it was all, you know, still part of the learning curve. But yeah, there was no excuses. My training still went well for the Comrades Marathon that year. And of course, now I, I thought to myself, well, Two Oceans is just as hard to win as the Comrades Marathon. So I'm sh I, I, I'm, I'll be able to do it. I must go for the win. But what else am I going to go for? Second place. So um, before the race, I sat down and I worked out a plan um, to run the Comrades Marathon in a certain time. And I thought that if I run six, six hours and 15 minutes on the day, it will be a safe win for me. So um, the day I lined up for Comrades Marathon and I finished in six hours and 15 minutes, which was exactly what was on my race plan. But unfortunately, it was not good enough for the first place. So I learned a hard lesson that year. Um, a race is a race. You don't just run against yourself. If you're going for the top spot, you have to be able and prepared to race on the day as well and read what is going on around you. So. I, I, went, I got the second uh, place, the beautiful silver medal. Um, but yeah, it definitely left me very hungry for the next year. Yeah, I'm sure. And Gerda, you mentioned the, the pressures around media and press and having to do interviews and fans and all of that kind of thing. And I'm one of those people who've uh, asked you to do an interview. But tell uh -huh. us a bit about those pressures. Is it something that you've, you're learning to deal with? Is it something you struggle with? Um, because it can get a bit much when there's a, a camera in your face 24-7. I think you definitely get used to it. Um, I mean, uh, there's many other athletes that's world famous and they manage to still perform under all of that media pressure. So I definitely think you can get used to it. It's just learning how to do it and learning how to 
handle it. So it's like anything else in a race um, or in training, you just have to learn how to deal with it. So I don't think it's always a bad thing to have media asking how you are or wanting to hear from you. It, it's, it's also, it's humbling and I'm grateful for that. And I get to share my story with other athletes who, for if I was another, when I started running, I was always looking up to other athletes and wanting to hear what they get up to and how they are handling things and whether they are training hard or, or they're taking time off. I was also one who would, who would also be on the lookout for that. So I do understand it from coming from a social running um, background. So um, I, I don't think it's always a bad thing. I think it's important and I think it's, it's a good thing to be able to share what I know and share my story with others. And was there any specific person that you looked up to at the start of your career and then in sort of where, where you are now? Yes, definitely. Um, I, could, I played the Comrades Marathon where Caroline Bostman won that year. I played it on repeat in my house when I was training for, my, for the Comrades Marathon. So, yes, I definitely looked up to Caroline Bostman, but Ellie Greenwood in the same as well. I, I was always looking how fast she finished that winning year. She ran the down run in the Comrades and I just, I was just so, it's important to have models and it's important to be able to get hold of very motivating um, material like that. So definitely yes. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, you mentioned Caroline Vosmond. Alongside her, Frith van der Merwe and yourself, you are the only three women that have won the, the Comrades and the Two Oceans in, in the same year. 2019, and we're going to get on to 2019, but that's, that's a, a, a a moment that you can certainly be proud of? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I know that a lot of people say if you run the two oceans and win the two oceans marathon in the same year, you won't be able to do it again in comrades. But mm. I think there's, it's, it's almost, history has already showed to us that it is possible. Frith van der Marwe did it years ago. And then, yes, no one else did it until Caroline managed to do the the double again, but yeah. I, did, I never said in my mind that it is impossible. I never thought it was. Um, even in running the, com, the two oceans marathon last year, I knew that I still had uh, in, enough in my tank. I didn't, uh, I didn't collapse on the finish line, for instance, or anything. And I know it's just all about recovery. And it's often not how you race, but how you train. And I think a lot of people make that mistake. Um, I made sure after the Two Oceans Marathon that I'm recovered before taking on a lot of strain again for the Comrades Marathon. So I think a lot of it lies in how you, what you do um, from, from the finish line to the, to the next start line. And a lot of people take that for granted. Of course, there is a danger of over racing. And I don't, for one, recommend everybody doing Comrades and Two Oceans every year, year in, year out, because there is always the chance of burnout. I think it's always important to listen to your body and to make sure that you do whatever you can to recover and not ignore signs if they are danger signs. Yeah. And uh, Gerda, tell us a bit about that uh, 2019 Two Oceans. They had to change the route um, fairly short, within short uh, amount of time before the race. Um, I did that race as well. I hated going up at Carbs of Ech. I mean, it was <sighs> really horrible. Um, but I wasn't coming anywhere near first place. I was at the back <laughs> with the people that run for fun. Um, tell us about how that impacted you as a professional athlete, because it, it's a different race compared to what you essentially had been training for. Yes, 100%. It changed the entire dynamics of the race. Um, I, I, last year, I didn't go to Cape Town again to do some training on the route. Um, I felt like I've seen the route enough times now to not having to make a trip to Cape Town maybe in the month leading up to the race. And when they announced that the route changed, I was almost so fortunate that I didn't do it because I didn't have this perfectly planned race in my mind. Um, I wanted to defend my title uh, last year um, after winning it in 2018. Of course, I wouldn't want to be uh, go back, take a step back after winning it already the year before. So my plan was to win the race. And I just said to myself that I'm, I'll do anything, whatever the race brings, uh, my aim will be to win it. Um, when they announced that the route is changing, I knew that 
a lot of athletes will be thrown by this. Um, it might uh, mess uh, with a lot of athletes' heads. Of course, it is understandable. It's something that we didn't expect. And also the fact that they announced it so close to the race. So in that very first moment, I, I was still, I can remember it, I was still sitting in my bed and I took a little piece of paper and I started writing down. I went on to segments and I started writing down where the hard kilometers would be now and where the easy kilometers would be. Um, and on that day, we were driving to the press conference and I told my husband that we should just drive over the route or he told me that we should just drive the route and then at least I have some visuals of the, of the hill and, and get a feel of the gradient. So we did that, we drove over um, and that all, already, it was such a small decision that we made, but it helped a lot because I could have, I had a, I had a memory of the, of, the, of the hill and when I got to climb up Oak Ox so on race day, it felt like I've been here before and I know what's coming, there was no surprises. So I think it's often small changes that you make, small decisions that actually makes a huge difference on race day. So it's also just a, it's almost a mental challenge that they set for us because in reality, yes, this is slightly steeper hill and it does change the, the race in, in the way that the bigger hill is fr more closer to the front of the race. But when you think about it, that shouldn't be a bad thing. That it, yeah. It's meant to make it easier if the hard climbing is earlier on in the race. So, you know, I just made that mental switch and, and it really it dragged me through. And I got to the top of, of Oak Ops and, and I, I was still in good shape and I knew I was strong. And I felt comfortable where I was because it wasn't unknown ground for me. So I think that's the difference between professional athletes and us amateurs. I think I've blocked out every memory I've ever had of uh, Ocarpsovac and <laughs> stuck it away as far as possible. Um, oh. Gerda, then comes the moment behind me. Um, there's actually no words to describe your performance at the Comrades that year. A um, couple of questions, and maybe you can answer it all, all in one, is one, do you walk during the Comrades? Um, two, what is your strategy to to go for such an incredible time. Three, were you planning on going for a time like that? Um, and four, don't you find the Comrades to be the most amazing race in terms of support and the fact that the streets are lined and everyone's shouting your name and does that help you get over the finish line in the time that you did? <laughs> Thank you. Um, sure. With the walking question, um, it's quite funny because until last year's comrades i've always had to do a little bit of a walk on comrades even if it was just for a couple of steps um, in 2018 i walked a little bit on cowie's hill and lo and behold the camera got me and i even announced it on <laughs> on television so um until last year um i've always had to do a, a few steps of walking but i can honestly say last year i didn't walk um the only moment in the race where i considered taking a walk was up poly shorts because I was really tired and taking strain then. But um, it was really funny because two days before the race, we were having a conversation and uh, my coach Nick said, just during the conversation, he just mentioned that we must always remember that when you are leading Comrades Marathon, you do not walk. It doesn't matter how you feel, the leader does not walk. And there I was on, on poly shorts. And the only thing I could think about is those words of my coach saying that the leader are not allowed to walk. <laughs> so I don't know if I thought it was going to bring bad karma or anything, but I did not walk. So that was really great. <laughs> so yeah, but then um, for the rest of it, uh, uh, my strategy going into the race, uh, I don't know, it, it was just such an incredible build-up that I had from, from, the, um, from finishing to Ocean's Marathon last year until Comrades. It was just this amazing time that I had. Um, I was fortunate, my, my husband had time off work um, and we had two training partners as well, Steve Way and Anthony Clark. Um, and we, the four of us did a training camp in the French Alps. Um, so both the men are quite a bit stronger than me. Uh, well, Steve Way was third place finisher in 2018 in the Comrades. So, <laughs> and it would have been Anthony's first race. Um, so um, it was great to have guys like that to train with. Um, they really pushed me. Um, they, they, they are so strong. So I often just sat behind them and followed the slipstream. Um, 
So that was amazing. It was it was an incredible uh, training camp. Nothing went wrong really. I, I just I, I didn't fall ill. I didn't have injuries or niggles. So the build up to the Comrades Marathon last year was was incredible, and um, I couldn't be anything other than confident going into the race because that would have just been daft. Um, I had all the reasons to be confident, but um, of course, still a lot depends on the day. A lot it depends on whether you not have a cold, a little sniffles, even anything can throw you off on race day. So um, I, I took that into account, but um, I thought that. Um, Having wanting, if I wanted to win the Comrades 2019 marathon, then I would probably have to run under the record time. So this, I still think that uh, today that there was more than just me in that race that was capable of running uh, a time faster than the record. So I did have the the record in mind. I I thought that it will. That's what it will take. Um, but uh, I think under six hours was number three on my list if it was <laughs> winning the record and then running under six hours. So on the day, I just, you know, I gave my everything. It went really well. My support, um, support on, on, on route was amazing. My second thing, I managed to stay high, stay new, and keep my nutrition in, everything. So there's a lot of things that went right, that went according to plan, um, which I'm grateful for. And, and it came together on that day. So <laughs> I don't know what to say more. It was just an incredible, incredible day. So of okay. course it was hard, but uh, that was expected as well. I, I didn't expect it to just be a walk in the park. It got, it got tough at the end, but um, that's, that's the comrades. <laughs> Again, I think you're being incredibly modest. You didn't just break the record. You smashed the record. You annihilated the record. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And Heather, tell us about coming into the stadium or into the, the track, knowing that you were smashing the, the record by miles. So, I mean, you could have crawled the last kilometer and still broken the record by miles. Uh, knowing that you'd won the race, you've been given the, the baton. Uh, you, you know, tell us a bit about that. I mean, that... Finishing the comrades to me was incredibly emotional. And I'm way back. I'm not in first place. Tell us a bit about coming into that stadium. You know, that moment, those few minutes running on the grass in the stadium, it's like I can't think of anything better or anything more exciting. <laughs> um, the few kilometers before stepping onto the grass, however, was quite a contrast to that. I was really taking strain. <laughs> I was, it, what felt like shuffling, it wasn't quite shuffling because I was still maintaining a decent pace, um, but I was really, really sore and hurting at the time. Um, I was almost just like focusing on, if I see a runner in front of me, just to, trying to get to them or even a supporter, uh, just trying to get from one, <laughs> almost, you know, 100 meter markers or something. So, but when I got onto the grass, it was a total different story. I didn't feel anything. I just felt like I was floating and I was just like, I had goosebumps from head to toes, even like now when I'm telling you about it. Um, it was, it was incredible seeing all those people so sincerely happy for me. Um, I think also the fact that I'm, that I'm a South African and uh, it was their own goal. It, it just elevated everything so much. And it just felt like this, it's like this, this big green <laughs> road that you can run on where everything yeah. just comes together. Um, and I think just having that moment in your life, it's, it's worth a lifetime. Um, I've, I, I, I would wish for everybody, for anybody to have a moment like that in their life where it just feels like they are in the place where they where they're meant to be and that, that this is the pinnacle of everything. So I've said it before, even if I'm not allowed, if someone tells me I'm never allowed to run again in my life, I think that one moment of running on that green grass, on the bouncy, awkward grass, was enough for me. It, 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 was, it was an incredible moment in my career and it's something that I will always crave um, again. I will always want to want to feel that moment again and that is what will make me always come back to Comrades Marathon. And coming back to that feeling shortly but before we get there I mean it must have been like you were you were running as fast as you could but you wanted to take for that that time to take as long as possible and I mean the South Africans were going mad finally we you know you and Caroline we had the South Africans that were winning the race again 
uh, Bonga Musa was winning the men's race. It was a South African day, which was awesome. But just a question in terms of mental versus physical um, requirements of the comrades. For people that are running eight hours plus, comrades is a lot more of a mental gain than it is a physical. You need to do the training, but you need to have a, a strong mind. Is it the same at your level or is it more sort of even par? Uh, I would say it's definitely still the same. It doesn't change. Uh, the mental side of running a race like that is massive. And I think we often don't give it enough credit. Um, the, your mental you, you, the, your mental state is plays such an important role. Um, it's important to have confidence in yourself, but not being overconfident. And it's important to know when to push really hard and to dig deep, but not too early on. So I think it's it's always a learning curve as well. It's hard to explain it or to teach it to someone, um, but you have to have a runner's mind, and and that's very important. And I always say that the mind, the mind is so strong, it controls the body. Your body will follow. There will be, of course, a point where your body really cannot follow anymore. But I don't think it's it's far beyond the finish line. I think your your mind will give up before your body gives up, and we must you must use it to your advantage, not at your disadvantage. Not if your mind tell you to give up. Well, actually, your body is still able to continue. So. Having that strong mind is so important, especially, I think the longer the race gets, the more important it gets for your mind. And it doesn't really matter f uh, with how, how high up in the field you are. It's the same for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. I had a friend that even said to me, it's really unfair because I only have to suffer for six hours, whereas they have to suffer for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, but it doesn't matter. It's the same for everyone, and we must not take that for granted or discount how important it is to have the right mindset. Yeah, I said to Bonga Moose as well when I chatted to him. I think one year when when winning the comrades is no longer an option for you, you're going to have to come back and and run with the the twelve hour bus and and just see what it's oh. like at the back. See what it's actually like. Yeah. <laughs> um, just in in closing, Chad. I mean, it's been awesome chatting to you, and your passion and your enthusiasm for the sport and the, the races is is amazing. Um, what does the future hold for Chad? I definitely have a, quite a few goals still on my list that I want to tick off. Um, I obviously, comrades is and two oceans is so close to my heart, and I don't. I'll. I'll never. I don't see myself not having it part of my career ever. Um, but other than that, I, obviously the marathon distance excites me a lot at the moment. Um, I feel like I've still got a lot of room for improvement over in the marathon. Um, last year, I broke my personal best time by quite a four minutes. And I feel like I am still able to run faster. Um, that also counts for comrades. I do think that I'm still capable of running faster in comrades with more experience and just more years of running under my belt. Um, but yes, I think that the, the near future, definitely the marathon is definitely something that I will focus on. Um, I, my, a big dream for me will be to break the South African marathon record. Um, it's also been standing for many, many years now. And um, I hope that one day and believe that one day I'll be able to do that. Uh, I don't know when, I don't know what this year will hold on for, holding for us. Hopefully um, later on in the year, races will start to open again as we know it. Um, and we will be able to compete again and work towards our goals. So yes, the future is very exciting for me. Um, I definitely see myself still um, running for a lot of years until I can't no more. Um, and then after that, I think I'll still want to stay in the sport industry. Um, I would love also to do uh, attempt an uh, Ironman or a triathlon. So, um, but there's just so many things yeah. to think of at the moment. But while my running is going well, I, I think I'll have to focus on that. And is Olympic gold a dream? Uh, Olympic gold. Well, if you asked me a few years ago if a comrade's record is a dream, I would have said that okay. sounds a bit crazy. So I would say that the Olympic gold sounds a little bit crazy. But, you know, for me, I don't want to put any limitations because it's just I'm just enjoying it as it goes. And every year my goals change because, I, you know, if, if, if things keep improving, I don't know what the future will hold. So let's see. Kada, it's been incredibly special chatting to you today on Sport SA Daily Diary. Thank you so much for your time. I think we're almost 
45 minutes. So thank you for, for all of that. Really appreciate it. Um, and oh, good luck with your training. And I uh, can't wait to see you on the road again at the 100th year since the first Comrades next year. Well, thank you very much. I'm very, very excited. And thank you for having me on your show. Thank you. It's been fantastic. Look out for tomorrow's episode of Sport SA Daily Diary, where we chat to the inspirational 85-year-old world champion, Arthur Duncan.